See? I told you she wouldn't be scared of the house. Weren't you scared? No, of course I wasn't. They can't hurt me. Although, when I locked the door as I went out, there was some screaming. <laughs> Oh, dear. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Squirrel Bear. there was a man and a person covered in straw being dragged around town, knocking on people's doors, collecting money and donations on behalf of the local farmers. They called him the straw bear. This became a yearly tradition. However, over the years, people began to get fed up with the bear. It began to be seen as begging and became illegal. The two men were arrested for begging, so the festival ceased to exist and the tradition faded out. Twenty-seven years later, a local historian by the name of Brian Kell decided to try and bring the custom back. A man dressed in straw with his attendant paraded around to music all through the town of Wittersea. The custom had been revived. The Straw Bear Festival takes place every year on the second weekend of January for three days and is approaching its 30th birthday since the revival. It has now become an annual tradition in the town of Whittlesea.
The Tale of Samuel and the Worm Samuel, go to the graveyard, stroke of midnight Samuel, A burnt house in the middle of a spooky fence where, where am I? I? I must be dreaming Samuel What? Who's? Who's there? It's a friend. Samuel ran to the graveyard. As he went, he saw scary creatures. <coughs> Hello, is there anyone there? As Samuel walked towards a big hole in the ground, a giant fat one came out. Hello, Samuel. I have been waiting for your visit. Who are you? I am the Guru Worm. So why are you visiting me at these late hours? Well, 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 um, I, I, I need you to eat me so I can go to heaven. Well then. You will have to give me your body so I can eat it before you go to heaven. Well, um, um, uh, it's kind of burnt. Well then, Samuel, you will have to bring me your ashes or heaven will have to wait. Samuel goes back to the house to look for his burnt ashes. After much trying, Samuel found his ashes, scooped them up and walked back through the walks and bogarts to the worm. Here they are. Here's the ashes. Hmm. The worm sniffed the cold, dusty ashes. Hmm, yes, 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 yes. Samuel! There is still something missing. What are you talking about? Everything's here. Are you calling me a liar? No, I'm not your real highness. Well then, Samuel, did you hurt your arm when you were younger? Well, well, I lost an arm when I was young. Hmm, right. That is it then, isn't it, Samuel? You will have to go and find the arm before you can go to heaven. Uh, uh, OK. Samuel ran away into the crowd of bubbles and bobbles to find his arm. Samuel returns back with a tiny arm in his hand. Here's my arm. Now everything's there, isn't it? Hmm, yes, Samuel. Hmm. Well, there's still something missing. 
I thought, I thought every, everything was there. Are you calling me a liar? N -n -n no. Well then, there's still something missing. Did you hurt your hand when you were younger? Well, well, oh, well, I lost the nail because I hit it with a hammer in an accident. Hmm. Well then, Samuel, go and find your missing nail and bring it back to me as soon as possible, or heaven will have to wait. Samuel is still looking for his nail today in the fence. Where's my nail? Oh, I can't find it. I, I can't find it. I can't find it. I can't find it. I can't find it. <laughs> The Buried Moon The people who lived in that wild and watery wilderness of the Fens loved the moon. Her kind light helped them to see the paths and tracks through the marsh and bog. Because the old Fen was a fearsome place, especially at night. When the moon was not shining, the boggarts and bogles, the dead things, the crawling horrors came out to make mischief and terrify the travellers. But when the moon shone so brightly, the fenmen could fish and go about all the business that those old fenmen did. I must go and see for myself this fenland, where they love me so much, the moon said. So she wrapped herself in a big black cloak with a hood to hide her light. Oh, witches, will-o'-the-wisps, dead hands, Boggets and bogles, she gasped. Oh no! Her foot slipped, and she fell tangled up in a thorny bush, and she was trapped. The cloak covered her. Suddenly she heard a terrified voice. Help! Can anyone save me? It was a lost traveller. With one great effort, the moon lifted her head, and as her golden light shone across the fen, the man was able to see his way to safety. The poor moon sank back. The hood slipped down over her head, and she was still trapped. Then the creatures of the dark gathered round her, taunting her. Before they fled from the light of day, they pulled a strange big stone over her to pin her down and left Will-o'-the-Wisps to guard her. Day followed day and there was no new moon. The creatures of the dark crept up to the fen folk's cottages and terrified them. I can't understand it. What has happened to the moon? What are we to do without a moon? The men said. How will we manage to live? I think I know where the moon is, the stranger said. I was lost in the marsh and was saved. I remember a shining face and yellow hair. She, she had a sort of kind look, like the old moon herself. The men went at once to see the wise woman. Put stones in your mouths. Take hazel twigs in your hands and never say a word until you're safe home again. Make your way into the middle of the marsh until you find a coffin, a candle and a cross. Fearfully, the men searched the fen, 
until they saw the great stone half in and half out of the water, like a great coffin. Above it the thorn bush with its sharp branches, like a cross, and the flickering light of the will-o'-the-wisps, like a candle. Quickly, they took hold of the big stone and lifted it up. For a moment they saw a strange and beautiful face looking at them gratefully from the black water. Then the moon's light flooded the fen, sending the creatures scuttling away, while the men could walk home safely. Ever since then, the moon has shone more brightly over the fens than anywhere else. Enid Porter, a collector of stories. When I was appointed curator in 1947, I had the good fortune to work under the guidance of the well-known authority on folk life and folk museums, Thomas W. Bagshaw. He impressed upon me how important it is to make careful record of the local name of each object the way in which it was once used, and of everything that can be learned from the donor concerning any local customs, beliefs or traditions associated with it. No part of my collecting has been made by means of a tape recorder. I've always had some misgivings about tape recorders, excellent though these are in the hands of people more professional than I am. I have had experience of speakers becoming so self-conscious that the resulting tape sounds very different from the person one is used to hearing talk easily and freely. I have therefore always taken notes, openly or unobtrusively, as occasion demanded, or memorised when I felt the sign of a pencil and paper would at once alarm an informant and bring his flow of conversation to an abrupt halt. What I have been able to take down from welcome visitors to the museum has, over the years, been added to what I have learned in carpenters' sheds, in farmyards, in public houses, in fields, or listening unashamedly to snatches of conversation in trains, buses and streets. Many people come to the museum not only to visit the exhibits but to talk and reminisce about Cambridge and Cambridgeshire. This is, I have found, one of the great advantages of being curator of a small informal museum. Love tokens were used by shy young men in the fens to declare their love to the young woman of their choice. One woman reported that her future husband had, in 1889, given her a true lover's knot made of wheat straw to show his regard for her, as was the village tradition. Young men would make two love tokens out of wheat straw, then, wearing one on the right side of his Sunday smock, he would present the second to the woman whose hand he sought in marriage. On the following Sunday, he'd go back to the young girl's house with his token again pinned to his smock. 
if she was wearing the token he had given her on the right side of her dress, then the marriage was not approved. However, if it was pinned over her heart with the ears of wheat pointing to the right, the proposal had been accepted. Witches, Bottles and Balls These bottles were considered to be an effective safeguard or antidote to evil and witchcraft. They were filled with any mixture of things, salt, iron, pins, red thread or even nail clippings, and their purpose was to protect the household by drawing in evil spells and trapping evil spirits. Witches' balls were beautiful balls of coloured glass, usually blue, red or green. They were hung in a window and closely watched by their owners as indicators of fortune. If the bright surface remained undimmed, all was well. But if it became clouded or tarnished, then sickness, death or some other disaster was thus foretold. Bye.